This summary lecture is on the normal distribution. The normal distribution happens to be either the most or one of the most important distributions in statistics. It is so because there are so many naturally occurring phenomena that can be modeled using a normal distribution. Um, we could model um, income, monthly, um, sorry, annual incomes. Uh, for a particular industry, we could model sales in a particular group of companies or, uh, or a particular industry sector as well. We could look at distance uh, people travel to work. Um, there are just all kinds of examples. We could look at rainfall or snowfall. All of these examples can, uh, are cases where the random variable, if we're talking about inches of rainfall, can be modeled using a normal distribution. So let's just take a look at a couple of cases. So let's just think of rainfall. So if we were looking at um, say annual rainfall or snowfall, we could say that there were over several years, if we have several years of data, we may find a small number of periods where there was just quite a bit of rain. And then uh, a couple of small number of cases where there was very little rain. And then the bulk of the cases somewhere in the middle. So this could be rainfall. All right. Or snowfall. We could talk about sales. Uh, monthly sales. So if a company, for example, looked at 10 years of data, um, take the 10 years by 12, 120 months of data, um, it may very well find that there are some periods, a small number, with very high sales. All right? And then you have some periods of very low sales. But the bulk of the periods are somewhere in the middle. Okay? Um, let's just take um, income. Income distribution. So if we're looking at income distribution, we have periods, um, not periods, but we have cases where Perhaps a very small number of people making very large sums of money. A very small number of people making almost nothing. And we could say the bulk of us are somewhere in the middle. So as we see, it is quite possible for us to use the normal distribution to model several phenomena. Last but not least, uh, this one should be close to home. Um, we could look at, say, grade distribution. We have a mean and standard deviation of grades that a very small number of people get very, very high grades, maybe above an A, I'm an, an A minus or so. And then you have a, hopefully a very small number of people getting an F or, or, or and below that. And then the bulk of us is somewhere around here, and perhaps this average is somewhere around a C plus or even a B minus or something of that nature. So as you could see, that normal distribution or the bell-shaped curve certainly can model quite a number of different random variables. So let us examine some properties of the normal distribution. Well, for one, we know that it's a bell-shaped curve. And by being a bell-shaped curve, it, we call it a unimodal distribution. That means it doesn't have more than one mode. It just has a single mode. It is symmetrical, so about the mean. So half of the values are above the mean and half are below it. And that makes sense because the mean is equal to the median is equal to the mode. And that brings us to the very last point. Now, as the normal distribution approaches the x-axis, what happens is that the tails do not actually go across the axis. They actually go along the axis, what we call asymptotically. So it's kind of like this, and it just goes all the way down to infinity. It doesn't really cross it. So we have a mean standard deviation. And so technically speaking, the random variable x can go anywhere between negative infinity and positive infinity. But for most distributions, that range is not practical. We cannot talk about infinite salaries, right? And negative infinite salaries. Salaries are zero to a very large number. But in that range, we have what is a continuous distribution. 
And the amount of variation in the random variable determines the height and spread of the normal distribution. So it's possible to have distributions that don't have a lot of variability to tend to be uh, very narrow and tall compared to ones that have a lot more variability that tends to be a lot shorter and fatter, right? And there's a bit more spread in that data. So you have different, different types, even if they have the same mean. But if they have different variability, then that certainly affects the shape. So the normal distribution, as we said, is just a bell-shaped curve. And you can see that this diagram just sort of verifies it. This upper half there, 50%. Bottom half is also 50%. And the mean, median, and mode are the same. All right? Now, we just see the different shapes having to do with the mean and the standard deviation. So we could see, for example, uh, curve C would have a large number, I mean, a large um, var variance compared to uh, curve A in this case. All right. Even if they have the same mean, the standard deviation or the variance would be different for each of those. Now, because this is a probability distribution, a logical question is, how do we find probabilities under the normal curve. So here is a mean and standard deviation. What if I were interested in the probability or the likelihood of a value falling between x1 and x2, if we happen to call it that? Well, it so happens that this area, this is an area, the probability is really that area between those two points. All right? And how do we find that area? Well, that area can be found by integrating x1 to x2, that function f of x, d of x. Now, you've done calculus, and you've done differential calculus, but this is now integral calculus, where differentiation has to do with the slope of a curve, integration has to do with the area under that curve. So what we would do is we would have to substitute for f of x right in here. But the problem is that, as you can see, this is a fancy looking formula. And none of us really want to have to deal with that. So the question is, how can we deal with it? Well, we could do that uh, by essentially using a curve called the standard normal. So here's an example. If you wanted to find a probability of being between A and B, then let me just put the what's not showing up here in terms of those symbols. Uh, the probability of X being greater than or equal to A, but less than or equal to B, so which is the shaded region right here. So if we wanted that, we would have to do that integral from A to B of F of X, D of X. But we're not going to do that. Why? Because we have a beautiful distribution called the standard normal. Well, the standard normal distribution is a normal distribution, but it has some features to it. One, the mean is zero. Standard deviation is one. The horizontal axis is actually in standard deviations, and we call them z-values. I'll explain that to you shortly a bit more. And then the values can be positive or negative. Here's what the standard normal variable looks like. It looks like this, which is z, which is our, instead of x, which is our, our random variable, we would now define it as z. And if you look at this, what we're doing is we're taking every value from the distribution, subtracting the mean from it, and then dividing it by the standard deviation. So in other words, we're taking every x and converting it to a z. And the z basically represents the distance of that x from the mean in standard deviations. Think about it. The dis what's the distance between x and z? Sorry, x and, and the mean? It's just x minus mu. And now if I want to express that in standard deviations, well, I divide by the size of a standard deviation. And then that gives me z. So z really is the distance between any value in the distribution and the mean expressed in standard deviations. It's like converting inches to feet. What we would have to do is to divide by a unit, of, uh, which is basically 12. 12 inches would be one foot. 
And so in this case, we would take the value of a standard deviation, divide the distance by that value, and then say that x is this many standard deviations, z standard deviations from the mean. Okay? So because we can convert every x to a z value, a corresponding z value, what does that mean? Well, that means that the standard normal is just a scaled version of the normal distribution. So let's just say this is our normal distribution, mu x, sigma x, and our random variable is x, where we could convert it to a z. And this would be mu z, sigma z, and z is our random, uh, our random variable in this case. And how do we go from 1 to the next? We say z is equal to x minus mu over sigma. But what do we know about mu z? For the standard normal, mu z is 0, and the standard deviation of z is equal to 1. All right? In the case of the original normal distribution, mu x would just be what we refer to as the mean mu, and sigma x would just be what we refer to as the standard deviation sigma. So those two things are equivalent in the sense that they are both normal distributions, but one is a scaled version. Now, the area under the standard normal is equal to 1. And what do we know about probabilities? Probabilities add up to 1. So if I wanted to find the probability of being between x1 and x2, all right, then I'm sure you'd agree that whatever that area is, is going to be less than 1, since the entire area is equal to 1. So what if it were, let's just say it was 0.4 or 40%. So what we're saying is that that red shaded region is 40% of the total area, which means the probability of being between x1 and x2 is 0.4, or 40%. So if we could just take the normal distribution and map it onto the standard normal and find these shaded regions that we're interested in, we would have the probability associated with any <clears throat> question that we're interested in. All right? So, how do we get the size of that shaded region? Well, it's our luck. Enter in the standard normal table. The standard table. All right? So, we have a standard normal table. And we have z values, and uh, the z values will start at 0 0.0, 0 0.1, and some tables go up to th 3. Point, uh, um, I believe it is 3.9, or but I think our book just sort of goes up to 3.00. Uh, Doesn't matter. Uh, and then the second decimal place is over here: 0 0.01, 0 0.02, 0 0.09. So what happens is that if we know the z value, we could get from this table the area. And what is that area? Well, in this table, here's what it would give us. If we give it a z value, and that's the zero, the center line, the table gives us the value of the shaded region. So all the values in here, in the table under the table, will be that shaded region. So, if, for example, we took a number like 1.02 and we found whatever that area is, well, that area would be this piece right here. And then what we need to remember is that because the entire area of the normal distribution is equal to 1, half of it is 0.5. So, if we were interested in the tail, what would we do? Well, we would simply take 0.5 and subtract from it the value of this area, and that would give us the tail. That's how we do it. So you need to keep that in mind in terms of how you will manipulate the table to get the areas that you want. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to continue and just sort of go through the rest of the normal distribution, just the sort of background behind it, and then provide you with a separate um, sample or example.
in terms of how we use the normal distribution. Okay? You will hear some of what I've already repeated. Um, sorry, I've said repeated here. So any normal distribution is any mean and a standard deviation. So basically saying any normal distribution with mu and sigma can be scaled into a standard normal. And I've already mentioned that. So how we scale it? Z is equal to x minus mu over sigma. That's your, how you're scaling. Any specific x can be converted to a z value. All right? Any specific x can be converted to a z value. So as a simple example, if we have um, x is normally distributed with a mean of 100 standard deviation of 50, and so we could basically say x is distributed with a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 50. What is the z value when x is 250? So here's our x value. Here's our mean, which is 100, standard deviation 50, 3.0. So in other words, 250 for this distribution is three standard deviations from the mean. Okay? Three standard deviations from the mean. So the standard normal distribution provides probabilities or areas under the normal curve associated with different z values. And the table that we have, if we take z, it will give us this area right here. And that's in the table. That is the area in the table. And these are z values on the outside. First decimal place, second decimal place. That will give us this area right here. All right? Keep that in mind. Here's just another example showing the z values. And for this um, z value of 2.0, then the area between the 0 and the z value is 47.72. If I were to draw that for you, it would look something like this. So this is 2.0. This is the 0. That's the standard normal we're dealing with now. So if that's the standard normal, this shaded region is 0.4772. So how do we go about using the normal distribution? We do the following. Step number one, determine the mean and the standard deviation. We either determine that or we're given that. Then define the event of interest. Basically what it means is to just state what probability you're interested in. It could be the probability of being greater than a particular value or less than a particular value or between two values. All of those are possible. All right. So I could have easily had probability of x being less than or equal to x2. And I've already given you an example of the probability being between two different values. Convert the normal distribution to the standard normal question. How do we do that? We do that by using the scaling of the x values. How do we do the scaling of the x values? We scale them by saying z is equal to x minus mu over sigma. That's how we scale them. And then we go to the table to give us the probability that is associated with this z value that we've calculated. Okay. Determine the desired probability using the knowledge that the probability of a value being on either side of the mean is 50%, and the total probability under the normal distribution is 1.0. So if you need to calculate a tail value, and you have this area right here, let's just call it A, associated with Z, then the area in the tail, in this case, would be 0.5 minus the area associated with the z value. That would be our z value right here. What if we were interested in being between z1 and say z2? This should, that red shaded, or maybe I should have used uh, black instead. Well, let's cross hatch it with black. So in a case like that, when we use this z value, we will get this area, the first part. So that probability of being in that space would be A, Z2. 
But then we also need this piece right here. Well, if that Z1 was on the other side of the zero, we would just get that same shaded region right here. Uh, and so all we need to add to that is just is Z1. Now I've reversed them. I could easily say AZ1 plus AZ2. All right? That would be the probability of Z being between Z1 and Z2. And that would be obviously equivalent to some probability that X is greater than or equal to X1 less than or equal to X, sorry, 2. All right? So just once you understand these general concepts, general principles, it is relatively easy to apply the normal distribution. All right? One thing I want you to keep in mind is that with that formula, Z is equal to X minus mu over sigma, you can manipulate the um, Z values, or, or you could basically manipulate that equation to get whatever you want. So in this case, we've assumed that we have X, mu, and sigma, and we want to find Z. What if we wanted to find a particular X value? We could manipulate this formula to say X is equal to mu plus Z times sigma. Now, what's the circumstance where we might need something like this? I might say to you, we have an example here where the mean and the standard deviation are given to us. And a store owner would like to have, let's say that's the mean and standard deviation of waiting times. All right? Waiting times. Um, so if the store owner wants to establish um, a benchmark that if she considers the top 25% waiting times are totally unacceptable, top 25%, then the question is, what is the point at which the store owner considers waiting to be unacceptable? So remember, the top 25% is unacceptable. So what we will do is we'll say, let us call that point x0. So that's our benchmark, because beyond that, that group here is waiting an unacceptable, waiting too long. All right? So since this group is waiting too long, we want to figure out what time is that that basically represents waiting too long. And we might want to compensate them, you know, give them an ice cream or something. So how can we find this x value? Well, if we look at the formula... As I've shown you here before, we could figure out x by just manipulating that formula. And, um, and then um, when we figure out uh, what uh, x is, we will certainly, um, you know, we should be able to just uh, manipulate that. But to get x, we know what the mean is, we know what the standard deviation is. So now what we're trying to do is to find what z is. But what do we need to find z? We know that from the previous example I showed you, on the previous slide, that if we have a z value, you have the area. Well, let's just do the reverse of that. If you have the area, you should be able to figure out what the z value is. So if you have the z, you should be able to get the area. If you have the area, if you have the area, you should be able to figure out the z. So in this case, since we know that this top part right here, waiting too long, represents 25% of the customers, then what is this space right here that we're interested in? Well, remember, half of the area is 50%. So therefore, that little shaded region is 0.25. So if we look up 0.25 under the normal table, then we should be able to compute what the z value is and then solve for x, all right? So what we should be able to do is something like this. Go here and say the area is 0.25. So if the area is 0.25, what is the corresponding Z value? And I don't have my Z table with me right now, but let's just say for the sake of argument, this was 
six zero point zero five. If this was point six five, I'm, I'm not saying it is. I'm just saying I don't have my Z table in front of me. So what happened is the area that corresponds, or the Z value that corresponds to an area of point two five. So you got to look in the body of the table to find twenty five percent is 0.65. So now we could solve for x because x is mu plus z sigma. Well, what is um, mu? In this case, we, do, we don't have some values, but we just plug in whatever that is. Let's say the mean waiting time was 10 minutes. The standard deviation was 3 minutes. So plus 0.65 times 3 minutes. And then whatever that is, that is our x0. So that would tell us at what point this, uh, people are waiting too long. So 3, 6 is 18, 3, 5 is 15. So that's um, 1.95, I believe, if I, if I did my math right. So that's 11.95. So that should be 11.95. And that is the point at which... 25% of customers are waiting too long. Another way we could ask that question is, what is the probability of a customer waiting more than 11.595 minutes? Well, that answer, if you work it out the other way, should be 0.25, all right? So you could manipulate that function any way you want to get what you want. And then I'm just going to show you the last manipulation of that function. We found uh, Z, we found X, we could find Mu, we could find Sigma. Well, let's just find a Mu. And then what if we have this situation? We want to find the mean. Well, we could find the mean quite easily by manipulating the formula. We'll get X minus Z Sigma will be equal to Mu. And you could say, well, what's a situation where we might want to do that? Well, the situation, an example would be, what if the store owner now says, I'm going to work on reducing the average waiting times. Standard deviation might still be the same, three. I don't know what the mean is, but now I want no more than 25%, the same 25% to be waiting no more than nine minutes. Uh, to be waiting. In other words, the people who wait 9 minutes or more should be no more than 25%. So remember now, at 11.25, right? 11.95, uh, sorry, minutes, 25% of people were waiting that, much, that long. But now, we want to shrink things a little bit. So we want a smaller, a smaller percentage of people. So that 25% of people that are waiting too long now will be waiting no more, will be waiting... Um, nine minutes now or more, right? So now this is now 0.25, whereas before that used to be 11. 25% of people were waiting 11.95 um, minutes now or more. Now we're seeing 25% of the customers are waiting only nine minutes or more, all right? So the company is doing better. So the question could be, what is the new average waiting time? So we know this 25%. We could figure out what this space is, which we could, it would give us our Z value. So that area would give us the Z value. The standard deviation is not changing. And um, we could figure out for the area, which is also 25%, what the z value is. We can look up the table. Now I use the arbitrary example um, value of 0.65. So if I use 0.65 here, I would have 3 is the standard deviation, 0.65 is my z value, x is 9, and now I could actually compute the new mean. And I would have an answer to that question. So you should know how to manipulate the entire formula to get x, mu, z, or sigma. So sometimes we may actually leave the mean the same and say, what should the new standard deviation be? So that way we could get the result that we want. In which case, if you want to reduce variability in a real sense, in a real life sense, what you may want to do is to automate 
when you automate and you use less human labor, which is not a good thing uh, in a lot of cases because people don't want to lose jobs. But if you could find a way to standardize your systems or your processes, you might very well be able to lower the variability. And in lowering the variability, you may have fewer people actually waiting an inadequate amount of time. Okay? So statistics can be quite useful in helping us do the analysis and um, using that analysis to make business decisions. So in summary, what we've looked at is the normal distribution, which is the most important distribution in statistics. It is a bell-shaped curve, symmetrical, unimodal, mean, median, and mode are all equal. And that is a continuous distribution. So as such, the probability of a single value of a point is zero. We are typically interested in the probability of being in a range x being greater than a particular value, x being less than a particular value, or x being between two values. And to assist us so that we do not have to do integral calculus, what we would do is to use the standard normal. The standard normal allows us to use the z values associated with the x values and use the table to find the areas under the curve. That makes life a whole lot easier.